I have never ever felt a pain like this, ever. All Zakia McCormick knows was that her son was snuck into that house by a 16-year-old girl. But when her father walked in on them, she claimed to not know him. He does appear to be known to the daughter. Uh, he is not a stranger. When the father asked the daughter, you know, who is this guy? She, it's, it's on her, I think, because she's the one that said, I don't know. So she basically threw her boyfriend under the bus. Investigators tell us the girl's dad called 911, got into an argument with McCormick, and then shot him because the dad saw him reach for something and was afraid. To me, the key to this whole case is what happens between the 911 call and the shooting because there seems to be some sort of altercation. The father was hospitalized after a panic attack. He said to have health issues. That little boy, he wasn't even thinking of, you know, and then a dad's going to believe their daughter, their baby girl. It's just a loser situation. That was my baby brother. I miss him so much. And I wish it didn't happen. I would like my baby baby. But I know that I'm not supposed Jairon McCormick wore bow ties, colorful ones. His friend called him Birdman for his signature bird calls at the hallway at school. Last week, this good-spirited 17-year-old apparently snuck into his girlfriend's bedroom, and at 2.30 in the morning, the girl's father found him there. The daughter denied knowing him. Some kind of an altercation followed, and now Jairon McCormick is dead. His funeral was Sunday. Everyone's very, like, devastated because, like, something so crazy so fast can happen. Knowing that I'm not going to see him again, it's just weird to me, and I don't really know how to react to it. But for those here who lost such a young friend, they want to remember how he lived. Funny, cool, outgoing. He was always making people laugh, and he was just a good kid. Zakia McCormick is Jiron's mother. She joins me now live from Houston. Zakia, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Let me, I want to begin here. You're welcome. And, and the first thing that strikes, I think, everyone when we see the photos the bow tie and that smile. Those two things have, uh, will tell us a lot about Jiron. Uh, Could you describe him for us and, 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 and describe why he wears the bow ties and where that smile comes from? The smile was infectious. It started even when he was born. Um, he was just that type of guy. He didn't do anyone anything. He loved to play. He loved, you know, the skateboard and, and so on. He was a joy all the time. And the, the bow ties, I mean, it's not... 17-year-olds aren't necessarily drawn to bow ties, and, and your son was. What, did he ever talk about, uh, he had to have talked about, why he, why he did it? Because he wanted to be different. He didn't want to be, you know, with the pants sagging and, and, and the white T-shirts. He wanted to be different. I know this is difficult for you, Zakia, but I want to talk a little bit about that night and, and what you know about what happened. And let's begin with his relationship with this girl. My understanding is you didn't, you didn't even know this girl. And when I was 17, my mom didn't know any of the girls that I was dating either. Um, what did, you, did you know anything about her or his relationship with her? I have never even heard of her name. Um, if a news station wouldn't have come to do a, a story, they were the one who told me her name. I didn't know her. And what was happening that night? Um, did you know where he was at that point? And I understand you were in, you guys were sort of traveling and he was in Texas and you may not, you were in New Orleans? No, we were home. In you were New home Orleans that night, okay. We was home from Mardi Gras and he wanted to stay because his spring break would have been the next week. And so he was still supposed to be in New Orleans. I had no idea that he was in Texas. So. What, what happened that night? Do, like, do, do you know what time he went out? Do, do we know anything surrounding all I that? really don't. I really don't. Like I said, I thought he was still in New Orleans, and that's where I left him. So when the detective came to my house and asked me did I have a son, a 17-year-old son, I was like, yeah, I do. 
He said, well, he was in an altercation and he was killed. And I was like, he was killed? He said, yeah, a couple of blacks from here. And I was like, that wasn't my child. My child is in New Orleans, so I had no idea that he had been to Texas for two days. I didn't even know. Now, they said the word altercation. I mean, when you heard that word, what, what did you... I mean, I look, I'm looking at the smile of the bow ties. He doesn't strike me as the kind of kid that gets into altercations. Right. And he would have never gotten into an altercation with an adult. With an adult. He, he wouldn't. That's just the type of kid he is. And I just feel like if the adult in the situation could have did one thing, you know, I would, if they just dialed 911, or uh, if you just told him something, you let him, like, jump out of the window or something like that, but not to kill him. You came in with a gun to kill him, and that's exactly what you did. What do you think should happen to the man who shot your son? I think he should be charged. Not only him, but his daughter as well. Because if she wouldn't lie and say that she didn't know my child, he could still be here. This is a personal hell. I have to live with this every day of my life. I was supposed to be his protector. And that one time that he needed me to be his protector, I wasn't there. So I want them to feel everything plus 10 times more than I feel. I don't even know if that's possible. Zakia, has the, the, anyone from that family reached out to you? No. Did they, no, no. did they send flowers to the funeral? Did they do anything? No, not anything. Do you have a, a message for them in, in case, I mean, in case they're watching today? A message from you? My message to that, my message to that father was to give a life, you, you should get one. And I really, I really, in my soul of souls, I can't find a way to forgive you. So I hope you can find a way to forgive yourself. Because if it was up to me, You'll be in jail every day of your life. The jail that I'm in right now. Well, Zakia, um, I really appreciate you coming on. We're going to continue to cover this story because it's, it's an important one. And again, uh, our, our condolences to you and your family. And I know your loss is immeasurable. Thank you, Zakia. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me bring in my dream team because, all right, now what happens? What happens next? This grand jury is going to make a decision. And, you know, you look on paper on this one, Joey Jackson, right? You're a father. There's someone in your daughter's bedroom. It's the middle of the night, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, uh, king of the, it's my house, my castle, however you want to put it. The daughter apparently, allegedly, and this, I don't know who this is according to, lies to her father about it. So should the father be responsible or not here? Joey, what do you think? Well, ultimately, of course, Vinny, a grand jury will make the decision yes. and they'll investigate everything. But, you know, so I won't prejudge. But what I would do in making an assessment is when you have a child in a home, whenever there's a 17-year-old life that's gone, he's in a room. Was he armed? Was he dangerous? Was he representing any threat that would possibly justify the father's shooting? Could the father have exercised greater restraint to do something other than take his life, like allow the authorities to come and to handle it? And that's just what troubles me, sickens me, and saddens me about this whole thing. And in the event that he acted improperly and inappropriately, he should be charged, prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Now, here's what I want to do, because this is Texas. And, and, and Texas law prides itself on being a little bit different. Uh, I don't know if it's incredibly different. But let's take a look at a couple other cases in Texas. First, there's a one of a father finds a man molesting his three-year-old daughter, beats him to death, but calls 911. This agonizing, agonizing call was played for reporters. Let's listen to it. <laughs> listen to me. Oh, my God. It doesn't have a house on this ranch. It's just a ranch. I don't know what to do. Is there, there's nobody there that could go find out that has the road number you're on? Come on, a guy fucking died on me. I don't know what to do. All right, so what did the grand jury do in that case? Take a listen. And under the law in the state of Texas, deadly force is authorized and justified in order to stop an aggravated sexual assault or a sexual assault. 
All the evidence that was presented by the Sheriff's Department and by the Texas Rangers indicated that that was in fact what was occurring when the victim's father arrived at the scene. No charges in that case. Then there's this other case, you may remember this one, Joe Horn, a man who took justice into his own hands when he saw two men burglarizing his neighbor's house. Despite the fact that he was told repeatedly to stay inside, take a listen to the 911 call. Mr. Horn, do not I'm go outside sorry. the house. This ain't right, buddy. You're going to get yourself shot if you go outside that house with a gun. You want to make a bet? You think. Okay, stay in the house. They're, they're getting you're, away. That's all right. Property's not worth killing someone over. Horn. Well, here it goes, buddy. You hear the shotgun clicking, and I'm going. Don't go outside. No, you're dead. Wow. Shot and killed him. Guess what? No indictment for him either. Let's bring back the dream team, Darren Kavanoke, <clears throat> chomping at the bit. So based on some history here from Texas, how about <laughs> this case? Fathers find someone in his daughter's bedroom. She denies knowing who this young boy is. Well, I think the key to focus on is what was dad's state of mind at the time that he pulled the trigger. And obviously, with 2020 hindsight, we can look at it entirely different. But in that moment, he finds somebody he believes to be an intruder in his daughter's bedroom. His daughter says she doesn't know the person, can't imagine a, a worse nightmare for the father based on the misinformation that he has, if that is, in fact, what he was told. And then the key is going to be what happened in that brief slice of time between when dad knew this was an intruder, believed it to be an intruder, was he reaching in his pocket? What was going on? That's the key. Yeah, how about a little common sense, though, too, Mike, right? It's a teenage boy in a teenage girl's room. Huh? Put two and two together, maybe? Maybe, no. but maybe not, you know, especially the information or disinformation that the daughter gave. And he, and he said that, right. that he put his hands down. Was he threatened?